Hi and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am also deeply humbled that you know um, the organizing committee has asked me to share. To be honest, my first instinct was to say, I'm so sorry, I'm too busy because today is the day that we have to prepare for director's address and a lot of uh, director's address comes and falls within the purview of my office. But I thought that it is really one of the steps that I could take positively uh, to pay it forward after I became a professor. But I also, at first, I was wondering, having come fresh out of the oven, as it were, preparing that document that we will talk about in a while, um, I really thought long and hard about how best to present the journey. And I then decided that it wasn't going to be like a presentation to the NIE REC, or the Recommendation Committee of NIE. But instead, I would really like to share from my heart a lot of the do's and don'ts as well um, of this journey. So a lot of it would be to tell you about what not to follow, quite frankly. So I'm gonna, I have renamed it 15 Uneasy Steps to Telling Your Compelling uh, Narrative. I have broken it down to about 15 reflective steps. Actually, Chu Hang, um, Chu Hang's presentation is a very nice uh, precursor to what I'm about to share because a lot of it is really a lot of reflection and he has done about half of the reflections and I'm going to continue on the journey. So you'll see a lot of synergy, which is great because it shows you that when you think very deeply about your scholarship, your research journey, these are the points that really strike you. So without further delay, my journey at the NIE NTU began when I was awarded the overseas NIE NTU Overseas Graduate Scholarship to pursue my PhD um, at the University of Cambridge at the Department of Linguistics. I was studying a very, very narrow area, which is really not just phonetics, but acoustic phonetics, which is using laboratory means to um, validate what you find about speech. So the topic of my study was prosodic prominence in Singapore English. Apologize for the typo. And I, um, as some of you will know, if you also come from Cambridge and are familiar with the system, Cambridge is a collegiate um, university, meaning that you do belong to a member, that you are a member of the university, but you also need to belong to one of the colleges. And it's interesting because um, unless you're an undergraduate, you don't really study at the college, you still belong to the department. But if you are an undergraduate, it matters which college you are at because your tutorials taking place in groups of three or four would very often take place at the college. So in fact, I always tell our TSB students that you are so lucky because in a way we are beginning to mirror what Oxford and Cambridge offer to the undergraduates, which is to have almost one-on-one -on -one tutorial system even at the undergraduate level. So let me tell you a little bit about the PhD. Um, when I entered the field, it was at a time when a lot of scholars who had written about um, pronunciation in Singapore English did it through the only laboratory means they had, which is their ears. So it was really about perceptual, impressionistic observations about Singapore English. At that time, acoustic validation or validation using computerized means was very expensive. So the equipment that um, the lab at Cambridge at that time used was silicon graphics used only by Hollywood to produce very high sound quality. So it was 20,000 pounds per computer and I was horrified to hear that my colleagues at the speech, vision and robotics laboratory down the road were kidnapped, tied to their chair because of the expensive equipment, never mind about them. So I was really very frightened because I had to spend many long hours in the lab measuring speech. I had to measure close to one to 200,000 vowels for my PhD. So I started with a very, very narrow focus when I came back and graduated really as an acoustic phonetician or a laboratory phonetician. But at the University of Cambridge, um, I realized that they are the masters of self-directed learning because that's very often how I felt. I felt very alone, um, apart from my community of Singaporeans and Malaysians. Um, of course, being the person that I am, as all of you would know, I'm the prototypical college busybody and I was as well even in my postgraduate days, and quickly volunteered to, the, to be the PG rep or postgraduate representative of KUMSA, Cambridge University Malaysian Singapore Association. Before long, I ran almost like a professional kitchen because I would be hosting all the different, um, what they call, um, they had a cookouts, that was their name for it. And um, in fact, yeah, seriously, my housemate complained against me because I had parties almost every night in my home. 
I rented a piano, and of course she was a very serious historian, uh, funded by the Gandhi Fellowship. And she really didn't want to have anything to do with me because I was far too noisy for her liking. <laughs> but that was me. But at the same time, having said that it was um, really the Institute of Self-Directed Learning, I also learned never to settle for second best as far as research was concerned. So my very strict um, doctoral supervisor, who happens also today uh, to have supervised Jasper Sim, whom you saw just now, um, his master's thesis, told me that do not expect praise for what has gone right. We only have precious time to point out what needs further work. So when you go in there it's for supervision, it's about hours and hours of what has, how, I mean, I mean, he doesn't say it in that way, how bad your work is, but that's how I really felt. So one day, when I felt homesick, missing, like what director said, Italy, there's always only rice. Uh, in, in the UK, it's, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, pasta, see? It's a, what do you call it, cultural thing. I, I felt very lonely, lost, and I suddenly, I just burst out crying, you know, in his office. So he didn't know what to do with this crazy, at that time, 22-year-old, crying my eyeballs out as if someone had died. And the thing is, the least he could do, okay, maybe because he's male, he's not going to put his arm around me, but all he said in his very stiff upper lip, very low British voice was, after waiting for me to calm down, have a tissue? <laughs> That's all he said. And I had to get up, you know, mop out my tears with a big towel and just carry on. But looking back, I think I'm very grateful for that very, very difficult training. And, um, you know, as, um, as Singaporean children, we always feel that um, you must come back with that degree, especially because you are not going to let your parents down. So there are times when, you know, the journey is very tough because the standards are very high. And I did look at the river camp very temptingly, but you all know my character. <laughs> it's just temptingly. But uh, I knew that I had to come back with a PhD or else kind of thing, right? But truly speaking, with such a strict supervisor, it set me on very good stead, never really to second, uh, settle for second best as far as research is concerned. So one of the early breakthroughs that I had, really quite by chance, was that when I tried to acoustically validate um, Singapore English and to characterize the rhythmic pattern of Singapore English compared to a reference variety like British English, I stumbled on a way of uh, being able to empirically capture differences in world languages as far as rhythm was concerned. And this is known as the Pairwise Variability Index, or the PVI for short. It was able to robustly capture rhythmic patterning, not just in different languages, but in different varieties of English of which I was working. So uh, today it's been um, applied to multi-disciplines. It also has its own online dictionary entry as well as an automated calculation of the PVI. So this was uh, really a little bit of a stroke of luck, I would say. And I would also like to now talk about how the climate has changed so much from the day that I stepped in to NIE, 1st July 1998. Okay, I was told by my then head of department that if you publish two or three papers within a contract, you'll be considered a star. This is the climate some 17, 18 years ago. And the other thing I was also told was that tenure made people lazy. Don't think of tenure. As long as your contract is renewed once uh, for three years, you are okay. Amber lights when it's less than three years. So if it's like two years means not so okay. One year means please go and look for a job. <laughs> so I was quite contented not to have tenure and to just continue working and doing what I like to do. So my first reflection, truly speaking, as I entered is that never think that any job is beneath you. Instead, take every single job that you've been assigned, no matter how small, very seriously, because truly every donkey has its day. This is uh, Shrek's donkey, and uh, I really like it very much because one of the anecdotes that some of my other colleagues in senior management had heard because I had to give an installation speech at the dinner is that um, my task was to fetch the external examiner from the airport, okay? And the thing is, I was mistaken for to be the departmental driver. So, and then he said that he's quite surprised that in our kind of society that ladies are the departmental drivers. So the thing is, um, you know, don't be afraid of, you know, doing anything that's a little bit menial as it were, or even people mistaking you to be the departmental driver. I think the main thing to do is that be a good donkey. Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I told you, don't follow me. It may not work for everyone. So, but the thing is, what is the main tagline here is that every donkey has its day. So the second reflection I'd like to say also is that in many ways, I think you have heard very good examples, quite frankly. Professor Shi Shu Yuan, Her Tia, I was very inspired. Rita's story, even Chu Hang's story. But in my way, story, even Chu Hang's story. But in my, in my case, right, I really did not strategize. And I'll tell you also that I really got lost. It is important to strategize your research, okay, but never compromise on your integrity or values. And at, that, at one time when NIE went into this bean counting mode for appraisal, it really did strike me about what Albert Einstein said. Not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So this is important, although as I said, you have to take everything that I say with a pinch of salt, because a lot of it is maybe uh, what you don't need to take with a pinch of salt is how to avoid the landmines that I myself walked into. So indeed, part of my story, reflection number three, is that I really did get quite lost in the woods. And later on, um, and I think those who had very, a very close look at my dossier realized that it got, I really almost got danger, dangerously lost. But in a sense, do not be afraid of getting lost in the woods. Again, uh, Robert Frost's poem, The Road Less Taken, is not not taken, but less taken, because I've taken it. Um, sorry, that's a, type, that's a nice way of hiding a typo. Is that two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So, as I said, some of my senior colleagues who have had a ch uh, chance to really look at my, what they call the PRDS, really did worry for me even that it wasn't that I didn't have enough quantity, but that I was truly getting lost in the woods. There really was no compelling narrative that was coming out. Okay, so this is something that um, you need to realize might happen in your journey as well. So then, why did I get lost in the woods? I got lost because at one point I was, okay, it all started quite frankly when I was appointed chair of the secretariat of the TE21 committee, known as Program Review and Enhancement at first. So I suddenly got very, very excited about this role. And uh, my role, frankly, was to work with a small secretariat. Um, at that time, uh, my predecessor, the SPCS, Jennifer, her colleague Joy, who's still with us today, and a uh, full professor of education who was a visiting professor, Peter Taylor. Four of us had to synthesize five task forces inputs about what was going to be the model for teacher education. So I got very lost in the role. And um, after, after I completed that role, um, I was kind of like, it wasn't like as a result of completing that role, but I assumed the role of Associate Dean of Program Development in 2009. And I told myself that how can you be a teacher educator and supposed to be developing programs when you do not do research into teacher education? So that was the start of my getting lost in the woods. I began <laughs> to lead a whole slew of projects on establishing an evidence base for initial teacher education to account for and characterize the development of teachers' professional competencies and the development of their identities during their initial teacher education, not ITE as in it's the end, and their early career uh, work. And truly to focus on the conditions that create optimal opportunities for their development. So, like how all the others have been telling a very coherent narrative, I also had a coherent narrative, except it had nothing to do with acoustics or linguistics. And before long, one project led to the other, and till today I'm still leading one project. But I'll tell you how miraculously getting lost and how this miraculously came together. But So I started with le uh, leading a formative project, a bridging project, phase one of building an evidence base for teacher ed, phase two, and then it went on to, I'm now um, looking at BT mentoring and coaching, working with the Academy of Singapore Teachers, looking at the impact of mentoring between um, instructional mentoring program schools, IMP schools, and those without. So you can see that here is a very coherent narrative, except it's got nothing to do with my niche area, which is linguistics. So what do I do? Now, reflection four, 
there were times when I felt very, very lost and I did not know what to do. But I would like to say that do not be afraid of voicing your self-doubt to others. So in a very informal conversation with Professor Dennis Shirley, it was really over breakfast. I told him about really getting quite lost and not knowing whether I was frankly an applied linguist or a teacher educator. But what he told me really encouraged me. And he told me that all teacher educators, uh, by definition, have to be multidisciplinary. And you can talk about your career or research trajectory as being very fan-shaped. And that represents your disciplinary breadth. Whereas all of us start off with a disciplinary depth, which is important for the rigor of academia. He told me that his own story was that he is a historian by training, and then he's, of course, now very, very well known for teacher education. So that kind of encouraged me a lot. So do not be afraid to voice your self-doubts to others. There we go. Reflection number five. Do not be shy to reach out. There are many angels there to lend a hand. And the two people and members of senior management that I really would like to acknowledge and thank uh, would be, of course, Dean F.A., Mike Chia, who's standing right behind. Because his, his own research story is... Standing is better than sitting. Sorry <laughs> for compromising on your research area. It's true. So he practices what he preaches. If you go to his office, there's no chair. Except for you, I mean, if you're the visitor. But um, what I, it's not just about um, when you're being put up for promotion, but Mike also took me out for lunch way before, four years before I was kind of ready, really just to talk with me. And I know we think that, you know, um, nobody cares and all that, but if you do reach out, um, you know, they are there. The other angel is actually Prof. Christine Goh, whom I think is seated there. Sorry, my eyesight, I'm very... <laughs> actually, Christine is very sweet. She wants to also support, of course, the other LT. So I told her, don't worry, if you don't make it to my LT, I'll send you the slides. Christine is angel, an angel to me in more ways than one. A little known story is that she frankly led me to my husband. Truly. So in the midst of doing all this work, I also found her husband at NIE and TU. And it was all because of Christine, and that's true. But because Christine, um, in a way, was the first homegrown promoted professor of um, linguistics at NIE, she really was um, someone that we really looked to. And she really sat me down in, in her office, always told me, no matter how busy she was, that you know, come and see me and would spend one whole hour not looking at her watch and not texting like I do, but really concentrating and talking to me about, you know, uh, where I was and, and everything, and sometimes just listening to me. So do reach out to people. So apart from talking to members of senior management, talk to experts in your field. On the left is Associate Professor Anne Parkier from the National University of Singapore, who was um, my honours thesis supervisor. And on the right of, uh, is Professor Kingsley Bolton, um, who works at NTU, he's a World English Specialist. So when I finally didn't get so lost, I decided that I, I can be a linguist again, but should I position my research as an applied linguist, which is very, very broad, or should I position it within World English, which is very, very narrow? But by then, I was um, beginning to get a body of respectable scholarship in World English, very narrow, very niche, but very strong. So I was like, shall I be applied linguistics, world Englishes? And interestingly enough, I, I really polled people without telling them, of course, that you are putting forward your dossier. That's the thing, right? And many of them, um, in fact, these two um, angels told me that it was important to position my research broader in applied linguistics because world Englishes was very narrow. And they also showed me that even in my service contributions, for example, the fact that I am the president of the Singapore Association for Applied Linguistics, also then we helps you to weave the narrative together. So again, as you are really preparing your document, it is important for you to poll the opinions of experts and how they truly see you. Reflection six is kind of something that I, um, yeah, I'm gonna play you a song for a while. So this was also inspired by Dean F.A. actually, because I kept saying, the beast, the beast, confronting the enemy. I called the dossier the enemy because I hated it. I truly, truly hated the dossier. In fact, every time I go for appraisal, if I know that I'm not going to be put up, I heave a sigh of relief because I know I don't have to prepare the beast. Okay, but what I've learned is that you need to confront the beast and turn it into your BFF, best friend forever. 
And here I would like to play you an excerpt from Beauty and the Beast. So that's something that I played and I decided to record it and play it to all of you. <laughs> In case some of you don't know, I, am, I still haven't outgrown the Disney princess's face even though my, my nieces, my friends' children and everyone else has outgrown it. So don't ask me why. After I finished my PhD, I suddenly decided that from navy blue, which you see me wearing because it's more flattering, I suddenly loved, loved everything pink. As a kid, I was totally unpink. But after I got my PhD, I decided that pink was my favorite color. So we'll talk more about that. But the important thing that I remembered Dean Avey saying is that why do you call something so important a beast? Befriend it. Call it your best friend. And I thought it was very useful. And um, the thing about turning your, the beast into your best friend, there is an art to it as well. It is very, very, very daunting, I must say it three times, when you receive the document called PT Advisory for PT16. How many pages after you print it out? It's I, almost 100 over pages. So the thing is, you do need to come up with a list. I had, in, in the end, a four-page list, which I'm very happy to share, but here, of course, I have a truncated version. So what I did was, to-do list for full professorship dossier, task, Creation of folders and names according to PT guidelines. This is very important, okay? Later on, I'll be telling you when to be creative and when not to be creative. Those of you who have just gone through the PT exercise, you will know. It's very specific. You have to name low Ealing dash document number two dash RTS. Low Ealing dash document number three dash whatever. So the point is, there is an art to it. It has to be saved correctly, and there is a reason for this. Later on, I'll tell you. So even doing all this, you need time. You cannot simply create your own filing system because later on, you will get into a lot of problems. So the thing is that, um, so I came up with a list, and I, I really, okay, to be honest, I started, this was the start date, 9th of December. But of course, there are a lot of other things that you need to think about and uh, I have four pages long. But then even after that, right? Uh, oh, okay. This is, um, it's still pre-PT, which is, this is all just beef for the preliminary consideration. So if you can remember, I, re I really did not have a Christmas or New Year, everybody, just so you know. I have to fill up my collaborators list so that you, they will know who are people who, are con who have collaborated with you and therefore cannot act as your independent referee, or if they happen to be senior members of senior management sitting on the board, you have to declare it. And then I had to finish by midnight the list of PRDS numbers. Oh, I, I see. Because you then have to name what's in your PRDS and everything. And you have to insert junior faculty's testimonial and so on and so forth. So I gave myself, um, actually I didn't really give myself much time, but the only thing I can say is you do need to take leave in order to make a good document. Okay, don't th be afraid that, to say that, you know, I'm taking leave and, you know, is it worth it? Well, I suppose if you think that this is your BFF, then it is worth it. Because it is impossible uh, to complete it within a short span of time. So I did create a to-do list, which the true list, this is a really, really some exemplar version of it, but the true list is about four or five pages. And as you yourself know, there's a little bit of toing and froing with uh, Dean F.A.'s office. You can treat yourself after each milestone if you like. Go to your favorite restaurant, have a manicure, a pedicure, have a haircut, color your hair after you have met the milestone. <laughs> okay, reflection number eight. It is very important, I felt, to write your two page first because by the time you have prepared the main document, which asks you to document exactly what are your research projects, how much, who funded it, how much was it worth, 
you will get too lost in the RTS metric to truly tell your own story about your own research, teaching, and service. And the two pages, it's really, I agree, very, very pressurizing. And for someone who has to write a lot in my job, institutionally, as well as you know, writing for research purposes, I had, I'm the first to admit that I truly had a writer's block. And I really, no words came out. For two days, I could not write a single word. Then I went to my sister's home, and we were having a family dinner, and I started writing the two pages from my iPhone notes. And that felt good, because it felt like it was just a real draft, and that it was, not, it was something that I could erase if I didn't like. But surprisingly, the story came out as I started typing into the notes portion of the iPhone. Okay? So that's important. My own take is write the two pages first when you're not so lost in the details. Reflection number nine will then now really be about secrets to telling your compelling research narrative unveiled in five steps. I'm not trying to make the process, um, you know, I, I'm not trying to demean the process or say that it's very simple, but I think I would like to make it bite-sized and doable so that we are not so afraid of confronting the document. Step number one. Adhere strictly to the OFA advisory. This is very important. Many of you think, that, many of us think that they are trying, OFA is trying to make life difficult, but it's not true. They attend the latest meetings by NTU PTRC. They know what the requirements are. You have to adhere very strictly. There is a time to innovate and be innovative, but not in your dossier. So you do have to adhere very strictly to the OFA advisory because not only would it make their work easier, but it would also make your own life easier if you adhere very strictly. So there is a time and place to adhere very strictly, and you must realize that OFA's role is to try to ensure maximal success rate. And even then, I'm also told and reminded all the time that you may follow everything to the T, and you may still not get through. But that's another story, okay? But step one is at least follow closely to the OFA advisory. So step two, what are you known for? I think I started by telling you how lost I was. And in the last, I would say, four years, I have uh, beefed up a lot on my primary area. And I decided that you need to put there, what's your discipline? Okay, so I chose my umbrella discipline to be applied linguistics. And then I put in brackets, world Englishes, comma, pronunciation, research, and practice. So it took me a very long time to even cough out these few keywords. Okay. So how does it all tie together to tell a coherent research narrative? You need to produce evidence of impact as well as evidence of sustained impact. So I'm just giving you an example. Like I said, mine may not be the only or the best example. So one of the things that you can do is, is your work cited by reputable international experts in the field. Okay, so if you can prove that you know, a chief geographer working at University of Oxford is citing your work, that counts as citations by international, um, reputable international experts. So one of the other examples I gave was that there's an online dictionary entry of the pairwise variability index, as well as automated calculations of use, how to use this metric. The other thing that um, NTU is quite big about is, are you a one-hit wonder? You know, is your work still, does your work still have sustainable impact? One way that they can look at it, if you publish books, would be you have a citation, typically your citation index for a book would grow this way, okay? Has it peaked or is it still growing? Or at least has it stabilised? And that's the same for papers, I guess, as well. So it's evidence of uh, sustained impact, meaning that it should still be cited very widely even till today. So step three, you have to think very deeply about your research philosophy. How does your research inform your teaching? I think at the end of the day, we must all realize that our core mission is really about teacher education, right? And therefore, how does your research inform your teaching? That's very important. So I, I gave an example in my early career, 2000, where I needed to design an oral proficiency checklist for use by the Ministry of Education. And I had to, of course, pull the relevant samples out. 
And then I also went on to cite research projects where I may not have been the PI, I was the co-PI, that impact the wider MOE EL teaching and learning scene. For example, in two projects that I was involved in, it helped to establish the baseline levels of EL proficiency of our PGDE secondary English language teachers and non-English majors as well. And it helped to ascertain the reliability of IELTS as a possible alternative tool for admission. So these are just examples um, that I'm citing. Then the next point is, what else do you want to talk about your narrative? So I said that, you know, how have you contributed to scholarship on world Englishes and English in Southeast Asia, if indeed you say that you are a specialist in that area? So one of the things that cements your authority in a field is if you are appointed, for example, as a member, a, you know, chief editor of a journal in your field or member of the editorial board, or you are a series editor of a book in that kind of series in your field. And um, I also talked about my contribution to research in, on pronunciation of English as an international language. Again, I don't want to say that I'm the authority on PT because it's, I'm not. And um, in many ways, I just feel very fortunate and very lucky but I guess it is fair to say that increasingly, if you're in the humanities, it is important to have an authored monograph in your expert area by an internationally reputable publisher. So it's becoming the norm. For all you know, it's going to be even more stringent where you have to have more than one monograph um, by a reputable publisher. So the other part is about evidence of multidisciplinary research to cite external grants, if any. And last but not least, demonstration of multidisciplinary academic leadership. So this then became my saving grace because I was able to cite the research projects that I was telling you about, which had nothing to do with my primary focal area, under examples of academic leadership. So you need to think very deeply about how to position your dossier and your document. Okay, and uh, I think this is just the last slide, which is a little bit technical, and then I'm going back to reflections. So as a full professor, you need to have a research independence. You need to show that you have given keynotes, you have PI-ship, series editorship, journal editorship, and I suppose a first authorship is also, of course, first or sole authorship is important. If you have any research awards, name them. If you have research innovations, name them as well. So I now move on to talking a little bit about teaching philosophy. Um, I have spent a lot of time talking about research philosophy because that was my area of focus, telling your comparative research narrative. But I think that for the whole dossier to be coherent, this is how it should look. Research that informs your teaching or enhances your teaching practices and service that undergirds the entire research teaching nexus. So when it comes to teaching, you do need to articulate your philosophy. And I decided to articulate two philosophies. One, for my role as a disciplinary expert in linguistics. So frankly, I had to think about this because, as you know, when we launched the TSP, or Teaching Scholars Program, we were all turned into poster boys and girls. So as a result of being a poster girl, I had to think of a quote. And it was that quote that I ended up using in the final dossier as well about aiming to pass on love for linguistics through empirically informed research. Then, I also thought deeply about our role as the NIE and teacher educators. So I decided to play around with the word NIE, as you've seen our director and Prof Shi Shu Yen playing around, that it stands for nurturing inspirational educators who possess the values and competencies that can help their students develop to be responsible and effective local and global citizens. My own service philosophy, I articulated, it's something that I thought deep and hard about, and even before the dossier. And I think for me, it is about serving with the soundness of values and astuteness, astuteness of judgment. I kind of came up with this because I also looked at the, at the qualities and sometimes the shortcomings of leaders that I have seen and worked with. And I realized that it's not just the soundness of values, but astuteness of judgment is very important as a leader as well. Otherwise, you certainly do not want to be a leader who is christened as being blind as a dead bat. Okay, so it's very important. 
Step four, how have you offered your expertise? You claim you're an expert, but how have you offered your expert to first the institute and the university, then to the Ministry of Education, then to local and international bodies? Okay? And if you have won any awards for your service, go ahead and mention them. Okay. Right at the end, I also, out of my own volition, articulated my own longer-term vision for NIE and NTU, which is that my vision for NIE and NTU is that we can be the best at school and best university in Asia and Singapore, not just because we excel in our research and teaching, but because we are known for developing students who are capable of dreaming up innovations and solutions that can make the 21st century world a better place for all to live. Okay, so back to reflections. That was the part that I felt I needed to give a bit of meat, but yet I needed to also be very reflective. So 15 reflections, number 10. From snail to schooling. The schooling part, it was because the, the week that the full professorship was announced was when Joseph Schooling won the first Olympic gold medal. But a good friend who also works in Block 1 called me a snail. Never mind called me a snail, gave me a snail. And told me that, hurry up, okay? Wear your hair net and write, write, write. At that time, my little niece, who's now no longer that little, she's 16 now, she's a, a national gymnast. So in order to perform well, when we asked her, why did you win on this occasion and why did you lose on another occasion? She told us uh, very innocently that it's because of the hairnet. So I decided that it's the magic hairnet, but metaphorically, the hairnet is what makes me write, write and write. Given my very sociable, exuberant personality, it is very easy to be lost being a gaypo, as what they say in Singapore English, or busybody. You know, you poke your nose in this, you poke, everybody tells you, do this, remember the good donkey? You do hee haw, hee haw, you do everything, but you don't have time to write. But I'm telling you that there is a need for you to go undercover for a while, put on your hand net and write, write, write. Um, one strategy which I can also share is that you should take leave that gives you a longer weekend so that you can write. Most of the time, the first day of the leave, I am completely comatose. I'm not writing, sleeping I am. Okay, because you need the energy and also the transition period from running around like a mad, headless chicken to writing. Reflection number 11 is stay on course and keep crawling. All right? It can be very distracting when you look around you and there are a lot of exciting things that are happening but you are not really able to take part because you are really in a research mode. But I always tell myself and my students, and this I found from Facebook's Motivation Gym, not very academic, but never mind. <laughs> if it is important to you, you will find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. I always tell this to my doctoral students. So if you keep thinking that it is, if it's important to you, you will really sacrifice everything and, and you will do it. So it's very important for our doctoral students as well, you know, um, when they tell you that everyone and their dog, their cat and all that is sick and not well, it's really just an excuse, okay, or what we call displacement activities. Okay, the other thing to keep you motivated is, and I shared this when I had a chance to, talking about leadership is, you must follow a purpose, not a person. So when you realise that, why are you at the NIE? It's because you are trying to prepare the next generation of teachers who can transform teaching and inspire learning in the whole Singapore climate and even beyond. When you follow that purpose, you can't go wrong. But when you follow a person, okay, you will be bound to be disappointed. So it is important that you are focused. Okay, I did think very deeply about books that were um, inspiring. For example, this book by Shat Ming Tan, he talked about searching or Googling inside yourself. Okay, dig deep inside yourself and find out what your purpose is. The other thing that I would also like to add is, you know, today's story is about, you know, almost like a success story, but you must always be prepared that it may not be successful. Therefore, the only way that you can be successful is to redefine success and what it means. So success is not being promoted. Really, success as in life success, you need to find that for yourself. And for me, I've always been guided by Rolf Waldo Emerson's words. It's just an ex um, extract. To know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. That is to have succeeded. So I have to be honest to tell you that not everyone will be successful and it is important to redefine success so that you do not feel any less of a person if the promotion doesn't go through in spite of wearing the hairnet and writing like mad. It's a reality. 
Okay? And I think Reflection 14 is always be true to yourself. So that's me and my pink beetle, which I sadly had to sell off, but I have every intention to buy back, unknown to my husband. And that's my five kilo chihuahua, a little bit overweight, but never mind. Um, and I did one of these name tests that's found on Facebook, which is what is your life philosophy? And I don't know how Facebook really is quite accurate in sussing out what we are or who we are. Mine came out, be happy, be joyful, be you. And I think my colleagues who have been journeying with me for a long time know that I really am no pretender. And you know, if I like ping, I'll carry a ping harvester, even if it breaks protocol and stuff like that. Remember I said, don't follow me, but that's me. But I think it's very important to be happy and joyful in you. Otherwise, if you're not happy, you know, you will not be able to also um, tell the most happy story about yourself. And this is the last reflection, and I'm going to end there. Um, first of all, I'd like to tell you a quote, um, or recite a quote from Nelson Mandela, which says that education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. I would like to share with you quite a life-changing video that I watched when I was sent on one of the official trips to Mexico. And I think that um, after watching it, you will realize that you, know, you need to reflect on the power of education and be deeply inspired. To me, this particular teacher, Maestro Julian, really represents what innovation is even in the absence of having the infrastructure for innovation. So without further delay, I'm going to play the video. And that's actually my last slide. Tengo 13 años de servicio. De hecho, los niños que tengo acá son mi treceava generación en primer grado. Lo único que he querido para con ellos es algo bueno que logren tener una buena preparación, una buena educación. Al no conseguir computadoras, pues entonces digo, ¿y cómo hay, uh, enseño a los niños a trabajar en esto? Entonces, con unos pedazos de lo que son un cartoncillo grueso, lo que es este, ¿cómo se llama? El fieltro. Pues empecé a hacer unas computadoras a las que bauticé como pecero, pues. Y yo le, le indicaba a los niños cómo manejarlo. Por si algún momento este, tenían ellos al alcance una computadora, pues al menos yo ya les había enseñado cómo manejar las letras, cómo segmentar, cómo se utiliza lo que es la barra espaciadora, lo que es Enter. Es un juego, un juego didáctico en el cual el niño aprende a dominar las letras, a manejar sílabas, palabras, aprende a leer, no a descifrar códigos. A leer. Me acuerdo cuando alguien me llama por teléfono, por mi celular. ¿Qué tal, maestro? Me saludan. ¿Qué tal? Y digo, pues extrañado porque no sé quién es la persona que me estaba hablando. La cuestión es que la persona me dice que, que cómo funcionan mis, este, mis computadoras de, de cartón, de papel. Y yo opté por contestarle que bien, los niños se inventan y todo. Y no tenía idea de dónde había sacado él eso. Entonces él me dice que. ¿Qué me parece que se cambian las, las computadoras que yo tengo de cartón por unas reales? Y me empecé a reír y yo pensé que era una bruma. Y fue cuando me enteré de que el proyecto que había tenido desde hace muchos años fructificaba con algo real que siempre he soñado, que siempre he querido tener en mi escuela. decirles que al menos lo que están invirtiendo para con nosotros, para conmigo, para con mi escuela, va a rendir más de lo que ustedes esperan. Porque si nuestros niños de alguna manera son más y mejores cada día, va a ser gracias a todo el esfuerzo de ustedes y de nosotros mismos. Solo puedo acceder a decir gracias. Es todo.
So Unity is a foundation that believes in bringing the power of education to people or countries that have not. So I hope that that has inspired you as much as it has inspired me. Finally, of course, if you are successful, which we all hope and pray that you will be, we need to pay it forward. Always be grateful because whilst you are one success story, there are others who have not made it and always be humble. And last but not least, I'd like to say that not that I have all the answers, but my door is always open should you need um, advice because I had angels helping, listening to me, and they know they can really tell you and witness that journey. So it is really my turn to pay it forward. Thank you very much for your kind attention.